Hey guys, we're going to start chapter two, section two notes today. If you remember from section one, uh, section one was all about the roots of American democracy. Where did we get these ideas about democracy from? We looked at England and their political heritage, and then we also looked uh, to the Enlightenment thinkers, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and Montesquieu to get these ideas. What we're going to look at today is the lead up to our Declaration of Independence. Uh, we're going to start uh, in the 1600s, uh, move quickly through to the early 1700s and mid 1700s until we get to the time period after the French and Indian War when things really started to heat up. Let's go on and get started. The main idea of this section is that the colonists in the Americas are going to rebel against the British because the British started imposing harsh new policies on us. And this in turn is going to lead to the American Revolution. One thing that you need to remember is that uh, we were 13 separate colonies. We didn't always start or we weren't always working together. Uh, even after we declared our independence, when we had the Articles of Confederation, we were basically 13 little independent countries, all on our own, kind of working together when we needed to. What this slide is about is uh, our early attempts at unifying, our coming together uh, for a common goal. In the 1600s, there's the New England Confederation, basically the colonies up in the Northeast, agreed to a defensive alliance against the Indians and the Dutch. This lasted from 1643 until the 1680s, so about 40 years this uh, alliance lasted. And remember, it was just a, an, a military alliance where if there was a threat, they would team up. Just one example of coming together. In the 1750s, uh, we have the French and Indian War, where the French were along the western borders or the western frontier of the colony. So we're talking the Ohio River Valley all the way uh, west to the Mississippi River Valley. With this, uh, with this war, we teamed up. We had a common enemy, the French, that we needed to defeat. And we eventually did in the 1760s, with much thanks to the British Army. In 1754, we signed an agreement at the beginning of the French and Indian War with the Iroquois Confederation. The Iroquois Confederation consists of five to six Native American tribes in Upper New York. And basically, we just wanted to create peace with them so they uh, wouldn't fight with us while we were fighting the French. Also in 1754, uh, Ben Franklin uh, proposed what we call the Albany Plan of Union. He was way ahead of his time. He had the idea, he said, hey, let's come together as colonies and we can have one central government that would control the trade, that would raise an army, that would help the colonies build settlements. We could have a Navy, uh, do all these things together. Never happened didn't happen. Uh, at the meeting, it was adopted. They said, hey, yeah, this is a great idea. Then these delegates went back to other colonies and it was soundly rejected. Think about this, guys. This is 1754, barely 20 years before uh, our independence. And someone comes up with the idea of unifying the colonies. And we said, no, we don't want to do that. That tells you that in the 1750s, just 20 years before we became independent, people weren't thinking about being independent. People weren't thinking about coming together uh, in a formal manner with a centralized government. We didn't want that. Up until the French and Indian War, the colonists uh, were pretty much left alone by England. We were allowed to handle our own affairs with limited interference. The king basically said, 
they're not a, they're not in trouble. We're just leave them alone. Let them do their thing. They're making us money. But in the 1760s, King George the Third, the tyrant King George the Third, began to tighten his grip, and we didn't like that. We were free, independent, could do what we want, and then King George started tightening his grip. And we did not enjoy that at all. Parliament started thinking that these colonies were too independent, too free, too loose. And so they started to pull back is what was going on. And after the French and Indian War and what we'll get to in the next uh, couple slides, Parliament and King George III started imposing taxes on us which had really not been done before, and we did not like it. And so what we're going to see, starting in the 1760s, is this is buildup of tensions, that things are just going to get more and more stressed between the colonists and the British uh, crown. With the French and Indian War, the colonies were able to uh, expand west, or they had the ability to look west. Uh, we now, the British now controlled all the land through the uh, Ohio and Mississippi, Mississippi River Valley. Sorry about that. Well, that was expensive. Fighting wars are very expensive. And the British said, hey, colonists, look at all this land we got you. You need to chip in and pay your share of these debts that we incurred because of this war. And so we started, the British started placing taxes like this, uh, like a tax on sugar and a tax on paper. And uh, in order to recoup this cost, uh, makes sense, I think, that the British would want to do this. They said, hey, we helped you out, so now you have to help us out. We didn't like it. We resented being taxed without having a say in Parliament. This is where we're going to start hearing the phrase, no taxation without representation. In 1765, when Congress passed the Stamp Act, which required a stamp, an official government stamp on all paper products. This included uh, contracts, any type of license, like a you could say a marriage license of sorts, uh, other legal documents, uh, court documents, Newspapers, even playing cards, were required to have this stamp uh, on them that proved that you paid this tax. We hated it. We hated it, hated it, hated it. And so in 1765, we sent a letter to the king. We got together, nine out of the 13 colonies, got together and sent King George III a strongly worded letter saying that uh, we don't like taxes and that the only tax that should be levied is uh, by the colonial legislatures, that parliament should not tax, should not be able to tax the colonies. In 1766, parliament uh, repealed the Stamp Act. They were kind of surprised or shocked that we would raise such a ruckus over this uh, normal tax. We have, uh, Things keep building up. Uh, we won't go through all the details. That's for American history class. But we have the Boston Massacre. We have the Boston Tea Party, uh, which protested the tax on tea. We have the Intolerable Acts, also known as the Coercive Acts, that punished the colonists for the Boston Tea Party. If you look at that word intolerable, think about what that means. Or think about the root word, tolerate. If, it, if you tolerate something, you put up with it. Maybe you have a little brother or sister that you tolerate, even though they're kind of annoying. You put up with it. Well, think about this word, intolerable. You can't stand. You cannot put up with this. That's what we called the coercive acts. The British called these laws the coercive acts. We called them intolerable. And the word coercive, uh, the root word is coerce. And if you are coerced into doing something, uh, you kind of get your arm twisted and you, you do it because you felt like you had to. And so when the 
uh, when the British passed the Coercive Acts, they were twisting the arm of the colonists, saying, you will comply with our rules. We called it the intolerable acts that we couldn't stand. We could not tolerate at all. And so things keep escalating and escalating and escalating. And really, guys, during this time, very few people, no one was mentioning independence at this time. And very few people even had it in their minds that, hey, things may not go too well. We may need to declare our independence. Really, no one was thinking about it. Uh, John Adams had the idea or started thinking about it in 74 into 75. But very few people uh, were even thinking this. We still consider ourselves loyal British subjects. Uh, we just wanted the same respect, the same rights as the people across the Atlantic had. Most colonists, like I just mentioned, believed that we were uh, royal subjects, that we were Englishmen through and through. And so we held out hope that Parliament and the colonies could work out some sort of compromise to get rid of these taxes. Well, in 1774, uh, Virginia and Massachusetts said, hey, let's all send some delegates to a meeting in Philadelphia. And we can talk about all this. We can kind of coordinate our plan. And so in 1774, the first Continental Congress meets. And they passed uh, a letter or an, uh, an act called the Declaration and Resolves, in which we sent another strongly worded letter to the king saying, get rid of these taxes. The British said, no. And... We, the British started sending over more and more British troops. And in 1775, in the spring of 1775, things reached a boiling point out in Massachusetts, outside of Lexington and Concord. The first armed resistance by the colonists took place. Shots were fired. People call this uh, the shot heard around the world. This is the beginning of the revolution. Remember, people didn't know this was the American Revolution at the time. In 1775, when uh, this uh, skirmish br uh, broke out, people weren't saying, oh, here we go, the beginning of the American Revolution. We're going to fight to be free. They weren't thinking that and don't think uh, everyone knew where this was going. We know now where it went because, you know, hindsight's 2020. But with this, we didn't know where this was leading. But we do know things were getting worse. In 1775, the Second Continental Congress met. We said, hey, we're going to have to get things together. We're going to have to coordinate this. And so we met. Uh, we decided that we were going to raise a militia, a Continental Army. We needed someone in charge. So we named George Washington the commander of the Continental Army. And war breaks out. War continues. Sorry. More people in the summer in fall of 1775, started realizing that this was not going to end well. Some people still held out hope. In fact, a lot of people still held out hope that this was just an internal struggle, and in the end, we would remain British. But more and more people were like, no, this is a bad ending. The colonists uh, really uh, didn't get on board with independence until early 1776, just uh, six months or so before we actually declared our independence. And that was thanks to a pamphlet or a long essay called Common Sense. Common Sense was written by Thomas Paine. And uh, we have a, an assignment tonight that we're gonna look at excerpts from this essay. It is really well written. It was the spark that got the colonists on board. It was the spark that, you know, caused people to start saying, we need our independence. There is no other option. Thomas Paine said it was only common sense for, for us to declare our independence. He said, this is like, it gives, gives people goosebumps whenever they read it. He said, this is our moment in history. 
the rest of the world is looking at us and the history of the world is hanging on the outcome of this right now. This is our moment. We must seize it. And people are like, wow, this is our moment. This is our opportunity to change the trajectory of world history. That's mind blowing to me. In June of 1776, the Second Continental Congress decided to have a committee to write our independence document. Five people, let's see, there you go. Five people were put in charge of writing this document. There's three biggies that we should know. One of them is Thomas Jefferson. Second one is John Adams. And the third one is Ben Franklin. There's also Roger Sherman of Connecticut. But they were given the task of writing this document that would officially declare our independence. Ben Franklin, at the very beginning, said, I'm not going to write this document. I'm too old. Let some younger guy do it. So he was out. John Adams, who is one of the most underrated founding fathers, said, I would love to write the Declaration of Independence. I know what I want to say. I'm well trained. I'm well educated. I have the ideas of the Enlightenment. I believe in the ideas of the Enlightenment, but I'm not going to write it. I'm not going to write it because people don't like me. And it's true. A lot of people didn't like John Adams. And the main reason why people didn't like John Adams is that he was kind of a know-it-all. You may know someone or you may have had someone in class who always raised their hand and they always knew the answer. And they let everybody know that they were right. And every time they raise their hand, you're just like, oh, my goodness, just be quiet. Just shut up. That's how people felt whenever John Adams spoke. Smart guy, one of the smartest founding fathers, knew that if he wrote the Declaration of Independence, that people would vote no simply because they didn't like him personally. So the job was given to a younger, a red-headed, lanky guy from Virginia by the name of Thomas Jefferson. And he spent a couple weeks writing this document. He drew upon the ideas from the document for the document from the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which was adopted by the Virginia House of Burgesses in uh, the spring of 1776. What we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to take you to the Declaration of Independence. We're going to look at it. We're going to go through this. And also in the description of this, I'm going to put a link or in Google Classroom, I'm going to put a link to a reading of the Declaration of Independence, which is really good. And I want you to watch it at, after you watch uh, after we finish this video. Thomas Jefferson spent a couple weeks uh, writing this document. And he submitted it to the Second Continental Congress. And the Second Continental Congress made changes to it. They tweaked things. They took out a word, added this, rearranged that. Nothing super huge uh, changed, though. Thomas Jefferson agreed to all these changes. Uh, he wanted it to be everybody's document. And so now let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence. What you see is the Declaration is really divided up into three parts. The first part are the first two paragraphs, which is like an introduction right here. And then we get to a long list. It just keeps going and going and going. And this list is, this list is a, a description of all the bad things King George III has done to us. And we'll get to this in just a minute. And then we get the third part, which is at the very, <clears throat> which is the end. And it's basically our statement of because of all these things, we are going to declare our independence. Let's go back up and let's start reading this. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another 
and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare their causes which impel them to the separation. So what Jefferson is saying right here is that if we are going to dissolve the political bands, if we are going to break away, we need to state our reasons. It, it is required that they should declare their causes. So we have to state our reasons. This second paragraph right here, this is the Enlightenment through and through. This is copy and pasted from John Locke. And with uh, your homework, with your assignments from last week, some of these things should sound really familiar. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, equality, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John Locke, natural rights, life, liberty, property. Thomas Jefferson changed it to unalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And the reason why he changed property to pursuit of happiness is because of the issue of slavery. He knew that if he used John Locke's three natural rights, including property, some people would say, oh, I have an unalienable right. I have a God-given right to own property. Slaves are property. I have a God-given right to own slaves. And he said, we're not getting into slavery. We don't need to discuss it. Our goal right now is to break away. So he changed it to pursuit of happiness. Continuing on, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Popular sovereignty, governments are instituted among men. The consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form. Social contract right there. We give up our rights for government to protect us. When the government fails to uphold these, uh, fails to protect our natural rights, we have the right to get rid of it, and to start a new government. That is the social contract right there. And he continues, Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. We shouldn't just change our government for some little, you know, some little thing, light and transient causes. We shouldn't do it. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. What he means by that is people would rather suffer than to do this job that we're about to do. As long as we can live with the pain, we're going to keep what we got. So what he's saying is this is something major. What is going on isn't some just minor little disagreement. This is a major problem that we cannot live with anymore. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government. So what he's saying is that, you know, the king is becoming, becoming an absolute monarch. He's ruling like a despot, like a dictator. And so it is our right to get rid of this. We'll skip down to here. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over the states. So the King George III is some evil guy. To prove this, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. So Thomas Jefferson, he says, you know, all this information is the social contract natural rights, enlightenment ideas, this whole second paragraph. And he says, we're not just doing this for uh, one or two things. Let's list everything that the king has done. And so we start listing all these evil things to prove, to prove this, that King George III is a tyrant. And so he just keep, we list, 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 list. And we keep going and we keep going. 
and we get to about number 16, 17, I believe, and where we see for imposing taxes on us without our consent, no taxation without representation. Think about this for just a second. This is like in the middle of our list. What this tells you is that there were just as many other very important problems we had with the king, with parliament, than just the taxes. There were other issues. So don't think the American Revolution that we broke away just because or only because of taxes. There's all these reasons and he keeps going on and on and on and on until we get to the last part. In every stage, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have only been answered by repeated injury. Thomas Jefferson is saying, every time one of these bad things happen, we ask the king in the most humble terms, pretty, pretty, please, king, stop it. And what happens? We've just been hurt more. And he says, a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. He doesn't deserve to rule us. The second to last paragraph, nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration. We have appealed to their native justice. We have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war and peace friends. Thomas Jefferson has said, hey, we've even tried to get the English people to listen to us. Told them, hey, this is why we came over, our circumstances of our immigration. We came over for freedom and toleration. Hey, we are, you know, the common kindred. We're all brothers here. We bleed British blood. And they have ignored us. They have not helped us. And so we can't, you know, we, we're left with no other option but to consider them enemies in war. And then this final paragraph is the official declaration, our official statement that we're breaking away. We, therefore, the representatives appealing to the supreme judge of the world, do in the name and by authority of the good people of the colony solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. And there we, we break away. That's a pretty good essay, if you think about it. Think about Thomas Jefferson writing this. He starts off with his introduction. He has proof. He uses the Enlightenment ideas, saying that we have the reasons why. We should be treated fairly. And the king isn't upholding his end of the deal, that the king is violating our rights. You want proof? Here's the proof. And so we're left with no other option. We've tried and tried to be nice, and we've tried to work things out even with the British people, and it's not working out. So we have no other option but to break away. That's a pretty good argument that Thomas Jefferson lays out. And so we declare our independence July 4th. This doesn't mean the British just said, okay, I guess you're free, you know, July 4th, 1776, we'll go home. Nope, fighting continued. For several more years, into the early 1780s, fighting continued. But we uh, started making our own uh, path in history. We got off of Britain's train and we're forging our own. Uh, every state, every new state, former colony, uh, started writing their own new constitution. We said, hey, we're not listening to the king anymore. We need our own system of government. So we came up with uh, our own governments, our own constitutions. Every uh, new constitution <clears throat> that was created by the states had the following things in them. The idea of self-government, that we were going to have a democracy, a republic. We we're going to have legislatures with elected representatives people were going to be able to vote. 
We had separation of powers. Every colony had a legislative, executive, and judicial branch. We had a limited government, that we had laws or rules in place that limited the power of the government, such as elections, term limits. Uh, the governors were purposely weak, so we couldn't have this strong leader ruling over us, kind of like King George III was. And we had individual rights listed that we had, like the uh, Massachusetts Constitution 1780, had a Bill of Rights that listed people's individual liberties. We're going to stop here. This has uh, been a long section, and there's still more to it. So we're going to have a Part B lecture video later on in the week. But to recap, uh, the French and Indian War really started to, uh, was the change that started to occur in the colonies or caused change to occur. The British wanted us to pay our fair share of the war debts, which seems okay, but we said no because we didn't have any representation in Parliament. We needed delegates or representatives in the House of Commons, and we didn't have any. So we said, we're not going to pay these taxes. And tensions just kept getting, uh, tensions kept uh, getting more and more stressed until it snapped at Lexington and Concord. And things just kept getting worse. Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense, which got everybody or most everybody on board with independence. And then we actually declared our independence in the summer of 1776. And we started forging our own way. That's gonna do it for section two, part one. Uh, after this, uh, when you finish this, I want you to click on the link in Google Classroom uh, someone or a group of actors and actresses read the Declaration of Independence. It's really good. They do a much better job than Mr. Schoenhart uh, with his hick accent. There are, uh, it's really good. And so I just encourage you to watch it and you need to watch it because this is how the Declaration was read back then. And it can give you goosebumps when you just focus in on the words. Enjoy it. Have a good day.